Omaha's news leader, chronicling the stories and people making a difference in our community. This is KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Good morning, I'm Quinicia Fraser. All month long, we've been bringing you reports celebrating Black History Month. As we near the end of February, we're showcasing black leaders and their influence in the metro community. We're also taking a deeper dive into the issues black communities face and the efforts to address inequalities, disparities, and systemic problems that still exist today. Plus, the students working to diversify health care and make sure people like them get the treatment they need. For decades, UNO's Black Studies Department has offered courses on black history in America and around the world, but the idea wasn't always welcomed. In 1969, a group of 54 students came together to demand black studies come to the university. It took them getting arrested and two years to pass before the department would be established in 1971. Here's the story of one man who was part of the Omaha 54. The year was 1969. Lavelle Williams was a freshman at UNO when he was invited to join a group of students to ask the chancellor for a black studies course at the University of Nebraska Omaha. It was nothing like it is has developed into today. We just wanted a black studies course in the beginning. Now at age 70, he still remembers the leaders of the group warning. Now, more than likely, if we stay to sit in, we're going to be arrested. And so I'd say about half of the people left, maybe more than half of the people, the students left. But Williams decided to stay. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, she told me, she said, you know, your mother's going to whoop you. <laughs> when the day came for the sit-in, Williams and 53 others walked into Chancellor Kirk Naylor's office. They let, let him know, some of us, you know, we've been here before and we're not going to leave today until you give us an affirmative answer. When the chancellor said no, that's when the students simply sat down. UNO security came first and they asked us to leave and we said no, we will not leave. After the students sat peacefully for around half an hour, the police arrived. They said uh, you are under arrest for trespassing. In the picture in the newspaper, I'm coming out with a young lady and a young man. Williams and the other students were handcuffed and sent to the police station. Once we were taken in, uh, they read us our rights, told us that we had been arrested for trespassing, and they put us into uh, cells. Williams remembers a man working as a lawyer for legal aid posting their bail, $25 per person. As we were leaving, uh, it was said they were their bail was paid over two hours ago. Why are they just now being released? And so when I looked at the officer and I said, well, why are we just now being released? He said, because you got a big mouth. He said that to you? <laughs> he said that to me. While in the cells, William says he and the other students spoke about the police brutality they experienced and saw in Omaha at the time. Williams remembers one incident that made him stop leaving his house during the city's riots in 1969. The policeman uh, took a shotgun and put it to my head and said, and I will kill you. When I got home, I thought about it. I could have just as easily been dead if he'd have pulled the trigger. While scary, experiences like that only fed his desire to help in the larger fight for racial justice. Black studies, it's, it's a, a viable discipline like math, like English, like history. Black Studies Department Chair Dr. Cynthia Robinson makes it a point to teach her students about the Omaha 54. They put their, their reputations, their livelihood in jeopardy um, but they thought that that was such a, a, that it was a need to sacrifice that. A sacrifice that paid off in 1971 when the university finally established the Black Studies Department. My thought was, whoa, finally, after all this time. Joining us now is another member of the Omaha 54, Michael Maroney. Michael, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Yeah, and so, you know, today you are the president of the Omaha Economic Development Corporation. That's what people know you as today. But when I spoke to Lavelle, I learned that you were actually one of the leaders of the Omaha 54. Uh, yes, I guess I was out in the forefront of that uh, effort. 
Yeah. So, you know, what? how old were you at the time and what was your classification at UNO? Well, let, let's back up because it didn't really start in, in 69. Yeah. It actually started in 1967. Uh, I founded uh, uh, an organization on campus called the uh, Afro-American Council for Action. Um, I was one of the co two co-chairs. Uh, uh, a guy by the name of Jimmy Dow was the, the other co-chair of that organization. And basically it was a group of black students. And uh, we were concerned about the way black students were being treated uh, on campus. Uh, and one of the things that we did uh, uh, protest was the fact, the lack of a black studies course. Uh, in fact, in December of 1967, we staged a, what we call a stand-in. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, at that time, the Dean of the uh, History Department's office uh, and we uh, demanded that uh, we get a black history course taught on campus. Well, lo and behold, what the university did was they sent a white professor uh, back east over the summer uh, to study black history and came back that next fall uh, to teach black students about black history. Uh, I was not in school that year, mm -hmm. but when I came back the next year in, in 69, uh, the organization had evolved into what was then called the Black Liberty Attraction on campus, or BLAC. Mm -hmm. And they were sponsoring a dance uh, one evening. Um, I and a few other friends, uh, we weren't members of the BLAC, but we decided to go to the dance. Well, the uh, because of the way the uh, uh, student center treated uh, the black students in terms of forcing them to hire uh, uh, student center personnel uh, and insisted on they, them providing the music, the dance really became a fiasco. Uh, the music, the sound system did not work. Uh, so when people came, they couldn't hear the music, it, you know, was, so they would leave. And uh, the student center still had the nerve and audacity, although it was their fault, uh, to charge the organization for uh, ticket takers, uh, coat check takers, sound, you know, yeah. the music. And so they kind of got upset. And uh, they were uh, angry and were talking about protesting the dance. Well, some of us who had been around a couple years before saw it as an opportunity to say, maybe there's a broader uh, effort here we ought to kind of help shape. And so uh, we joined with those, with, with, with those uh, BLAC members and met for weeks, deciding that there were a lot of other problems and issues on that campus than just uh, a failed dance. Uh, and the Black Studies was one of them. And we had evolved from a Black Studies uh, course to say we ought to have a black studies department. Uh, I can't remember all the 10 demands that we asked for at the time, but uh, I, uh, we knew that the uh, uh, student, I mean the athletes weren't being treated fairly. There was no recognized black organization on campus that could take advantage of student activity funds. So those are some of the things that we, uh, we advocated for. Yeah, so fast forward to the day that you guys decide to go to the chancellor's office. What I remember Lavelle saying that he was told by a leader of the group that if we do this, we might get arrested. Yeah, we wanted people to understand that there were those of us who were real serious about this. And having experienced a lot of things prior to that point, we did not expect that we would get a favorable answer uh, from the university. So when we, when we marched over on that Friday, our intent there was just to present the demands and then give that weekend uh, the opportunity uh, for the chancellor to, to, to uh, take in the, those considerations of those demands, uh, although many of us felt he wasn't going to respond favorably. Uh, but we also then alerted other folks that uh, we didn't know what was going to happen and to be prepared for anything. Uh, in fact, some of us actually knew we'd probably get arrested because we weren't going to leave. Uh, so we had actually talked to uh, leadership in the community, uh, the Urban League, the NAACP, the Wesley House, alerted them of what was coming down. So I think we have time for one more question, about a minute left. I want to ask you, when you see the young activists today, 
what similarities do you see between yourself when you were that age and the activists rallying for, you know, essentially the same causes today? Which is, a, to me, is a tragedy. We shouldn't be having to do that 50 years later, uh, which basically says not a whole lot has changed in mm -hmm. 50 years. Uh, I think we've got to become more intentional uh, and there's got to be a greater seriousness on the part of the broader community to really want to see uh, change happen. Michael, I really appreciate you joining me today and giving me some more of that context behind the Omaha 54. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Still ahead, diversifying the sciences, the efforts to teach children of color everything from coding to biology. We'll also talk to our own Anthony Copeland and how he got involved in meteorology. You're watching KETV Newswatch 7's Chronicle.